Hello and welcome to this presentation about writing good open source contribution policies. Open source contribution policies are often long and difficult to read documents that don't really answer the questions that software engineers tend to have as to what they can actually do when it comes to open source. In this presentation, we'll try to clarify this and really help you write good open source contribution policies. So the first question is actually whether you have such a policy to begin with or not. And uh, when that question was asked by a survey from the Newstack and the Linux Foundation a couple of years ago, the answer was that actually most organizations didn't have one. Um, it was a bit different when we ask smaller organizations, uh, which, uh, you know, close to two thirds of which didn't have a policy and a really large organization was more than 10,000 employees where we really saw that more than two, well, close to two thirds of them did actually have such a policy. Um, but what really is, uh, we should be thinking about here is that this is a highly biased sample, right? If you uh, broaden this uh, beyond open source, um, um, beyond open source savvy organizations, we're probably going to have very different answers. So this obviously begs the question as to, well, what does it mean not to have an open source policy? And actually what it really means is that you don't have a written one. Of course you have a policy, right? It's just not necessarily on paper. And that policy can go from no open source at all to anything goes. Um, and on the other hand, having a policy doesn't give you necessarily a pass, as I was saying before. Um, that policy can be very restrictive and can be very bureaucratic and can be very opaque. And none of these are um, good things for an open source policy. to be. So let's try to graph um, diff how different organizations be, uh, behave ab um, about their policy. On the four quadrant graph, we have explicitness, like how explicit your policy is on, on top, how um, implicit it is, uh, whether it's implicit at the bottom and whether it's restrictive or permissive on the x-axis. So if we put small organizations, as we saw before, well, these tend to be a fairly permissive in their open source practices in general, but fairly implicit about them, right? So it's rare to have like an actual document that describes this. Startups uh, tend to be implicit about everything, right? And they tend to be less permissive about open source because they're really essentially focused on product. Non-tech larger organizations, they tend to be uh, really restrictive about open source, but still really implicit. If you move to older tech companies, uh, well, they used to be um, fairly explicit about not doing open source, so ex explicit and restrictive. Uh, of course, patent trolls will be all over there uh, being uh, highly explicit about open source being something that re they really don't want to hear about. And if you move to tech companies, you will see increasing explicitness and permissiveness with all the trendsetters that are really explicit and permissive. Let's have a look at what that means in terms of life cycle for an organization, starting, for example, with a startup. So startup starts to be fairly product focused, but as the startup scales, it starts to really rely on in increasing infrastructure. And as we know, all of that infrastructure today, well, I mean, most of it is really open source. And so you will see sort of the practice becoming more permissive as um, infra engineers come in and they actually want to upstream some of the fixes that they do, maybe collaborate upstream, et cetera, right? And suddenly there's an event. Uh, could be um, um, some, some compliance requirements. It could be an IPO. It could be a, uh, an M&A or even like the, the prep for an M&A. And you start to have lawyers coming in. And as a result, well, the um, policies become a lot more explicit, but also in general, a lot more restrictive. And really that's not the kind of outcome that you would like to see. The outcome that you would like instead is more explicitness, but the same, the same level of permissiveness, if not an increased level of permissiveness. All right, uh, moving to old tech companies, we've seen a lot of those over the course of the last decade. The canonical example, of course, being Microsoft move from being extremely restrictive to being increasingly permissive about open source, which is a great thing. 
Um, Non-TAC, uh, large organizations, um, as uh, they sort of uh, digitally transform, um, uh, tend to want to be more explicit about their practices, and so they do. And unfortunately, um, they don't become more permissive as a result of being more explicit. Again, here, what we'd like to see is sort of like this move to being more explicit, but also at the same time, um, uh, more permissive, right? Um, and so really what we really clearly see here is that we want um, um, organizations to become more explicit, more clear in their practices, but also more permissive so that engineers working for them can really participate in the broader um, open source ecosystem. All right, so what exactly is in a policy that doesn't suck? Well, it's really a, a question of perspective, right? Like engineers, uh, lawyers, and business people will have different uh, ideas about that. And so let's look at each of them separately. From an engineering perspective, a good policy is permissive. That means that you can really trust um, uh, your employees to do uh, as much as they can and really uh, allow them to participate in this broad open source culture that um, is uh, really an intrinsic part of, of um, uh, software engineering today. You want it to be explicit so it's clear uh, what it is that you can do and cannot do. You want it to be informative so that when there's something that you cannot do, um, the engineers actually understand why. And as a result, sort of like um, or um, bring that knowledge into their decision making process of what software to rely on, for example. Um, and again, gives them um, uh, a stronger, more solid base um, to, to have um, to be trusted and have autonomy in, in their decision making about this. And lastly, if, of course, you want this to be frictionless, right? You want you want you don't want to have red tape around your policies. You don't want email changes for like a single pull request, etc. On the legal side, what you want is to minimize risk. Uh, you want uh, to av avoid uh, giving away competitive advantage, um, giving giving away IP that you are planning to use defensively. You want to avoid infringement, accidental uh, reputational damages, etc. You want that policy to be followed across the whole company. There's nothing worse than having uh, open source software happen uh, without um, uh, the lawyers being aware of what's going on. Um, you want that policy to be savvy about written information. Uh, sometimes you really want things to be in written for compliance and sometimes you don't. Um, and really, uh, most importantly, you want that policy to be able to surface critical problems and not drown them in a sea of menial issues. Um, uh, you want to be able to focus on the hard um, decisions and not um, the trivial stuff. All right. And from a business perspective, what does that mean? Well, you essentially want a balance of uh, the legal requirements and the engineering requirements um, that uh, fit the business model of your organization, right? So you want engineering happy and productive. You want legal to be able to understand and minimize the risks. You want good communication between the two. And again, you want alignment with your business goals. And so in, in, in order to be able to do that, what you have to really acknowledge, understand is the tension there is um, between legal and engineering. And that tension um, is uh, good. It's there on purpose. Um, um, engineering is there to innovate and um, uh, legal is there to, to, to mitigate risk. And so as a result, like you have that tension and depending on what kind of com um, company you have, um, um, you will sort of shift the, the behavior towards one side or the other. Um, and then the other things that you really want to understand also is that uh, these two organizations traditionally behave, think, um, uh, are organized in very different ways. Um, uh, uh, lawyers tend to prefer oral communication on uh, the phone. Uh, they're on a manager schedule uh, with lots of meetings across the day. Um, uh, they favor spectrum thinking, like they're all about the gray area, right? Whereas engineering is really focused on whether things are true or false in general, right? Um, and they really have a conservative role in an organization, whereas um, engineering is all about uh, innovation. And, engineer, and engineers tend to prefer asynchronous written communication and uh, are on a maker's schedule in general. So coming to agreement essentially means 
and you have to acknowledge that tension, that's what checks and balances are. This is good. Listen to both sides, right? And remind both sides that their role is to achieve common business goals. If um, you uh, uh, leave legal, uh, minimize all of the risks, well, I mean, there's not going to be any innovation done anymore, right? Because everything is sort of risky. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't tie engineering's hands a tiny bit, you really risk um, on the company's survival. Right, right? What if you open source a key piece of IP? Um, that, that would be a, a really problematic. So really find common ground between the two and know and remember and tell them that a good policy would actually help both of their, these sites. Um, not just one. This is not something that's for the benefit of one part of the organization against the other. It has to be mutually beneficial for it to be um, well-lived, approved, um, and, and uh, properly implemented by all sides. Again, align that with your, uh, with your business goals, right? And lastly, know that it will change as your business changes, as we've seen with the startup example earlier. All right. So what really is an open source policy about? Well, an open source policy um, is about two things. It's about contributing to open source on one side and using open source on the other. And we'll focus first briefly on using open source. So using open source is a well understood problem today. We know what to do. We know how to do it. Um, the only hard thing is actually getting um, um, really actually doing it, right? So um, it's really essentially about compliance, but it's also about security, about making sure that um, the, uh, supply, the open source software supply chain, as we are starting to think about this today, um, is sustainable um, and, and um that, that those are uh, challenging questions, uh, uh, challenging industry questions today. But from um, a, uh, an open source policy perspective, these are well understood problems. Um, so what I really want to do today is to focus on contributing to open source. And to do that, we're going to look at um, contributing at work and contributing outside of work. Um, and so let's start by contributing outside of work. If you ask employees of um, an open source, uh, of uh, sorry, of, of uh, in tech, like engineers, whether they're allowed to contribute to open source on their free time or not, you're going to get lots of different um, um, answers. Uh, some will say yes, absolutely. Some will say yeah, but actually, I have to ask for permission, which sometimes means that I. I'm not allowed to. Um, some will uh, say, well, I don't really know. Um, and then uh, some will say, no, I am not allowed to do that at all. Um, and so we have data on this. Again, this is from a 2017 GitHub survey of actual open source contributors, which I, I, I find when you look at the data and you know where that data comes from, that is kind of scary to me, right? So outside, out of um, uh, those um, open source contributors, 47% uh, said, yes, I'm allowed to um, contribute to open source on my own time. 12% um, said that they had to ask. And 37% said that they had no idea. And that is, uh, to me, uh, really, really um, concerning. Um, and again, like this is also a super biased sample. So you know, keep that in mind. I think if you broaden that to... Um, whole software engineers, like the, the don't know part will probably be a much bigger. And so why is there so much confusion? Well, that's actually fairly simple. It's because the laws around this are very specific to different countries um, and even different states in the U.S. Uh, for example, in lots of the U.S., um, companies own uh, employees' production 24-7. If you find something really smart at home or in, the, in your shower, uh, well, it belongs to your employer. Um, and then some states have um, um, uh, different criteria, right? For example, in California, if you're working outside of work, but are using your company's equipment to do that, like a company laptop, well, whatever you're creating belongs to your company. And all of this tends to really prevent employees from actually contributing to open source. 
um, and uh, unless they actually are granted uh, permission to do so. Um, and in general, um, this is a uh, tedious process, a documented process, but a tedious one. Um, it's uh, usually for large projects and it's limited. You have to get projects pre-approved. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of back and forth. Most, a lot of engineers don't do it. And this creates lots of misery down the road when there's disagreement as to who owns what and so on. And also, as we move, if we moved increasingly into software with all, a high number of dependencies, um, that makes it pretty much impossible um, to uh, concretely work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's a better solution for this. Um, and that better solution is called BEPA. It's the Balanced Employee IP Agreement. It's an, an IP agreement that GitHub uh, created uh, a few years ago based on their own IP agreement. And it really sort of scopes um, the, um, the claim of um, the employer to um, creations that are made for or relating to the company's business. I think like all of you should adopt something like this um, because it's just, it's just much clearer and much better and matches the mental model that everyone has much better. Um, and so uh, uh, really um, uh, a strong recommendation here. And as you see, what's interesting about this is um, a good contribution policies has um, impact that's broader than the policy itself, for example, on uh, employee agreements. All right, so let's now focus on contributing at work. And when we focus on contributing at work, well, well there are really two points to it. One point, which is patching software, and the other one, which is actually releasing software that the, you've created um, within your own organization and sharing that with the world. Let's start with that. Um, uh, here we see um, um, that um, you want to make, first of all, really distinguish um, large open source projects from tiny things, right? If you've written um, a small, uh, really tiny module, um, a, a large example, some integration samples, um, uh, really make it super easy for those to be open sourced. Google had this excellent sort of like smaller than 100 lines of code rule, which is, you know, really good thumb rule that you can apply if you have built trust and autonomy in your engineering organization to deal with open source. For everything else, the large projects, what matters, first of all, of course, is to make sure that the team that is releasing it um, um, wants to uh, continue um, uh, maintaining that software long term because you don't want to do the open source sort of like throw over the wall kind of strategy. That is bad for your organization. It's bad for the open source ecosystem. It makes you look bad. Like you really shouldn't be doing this. Have well oiled and well documented processes, checklists, templates, tooling to do all of this. Um, there are great examples of that on the Tudor Group uh, repository, the policies repository. Um, and really, if you have an OSPO, make the OSPO sort of really help those um, new projects to figure out um, how to work in the open because that's different. Talking of which, um, I would strongly advise you to promote working in the open from the get go whenever that's possible because that makes the whole um, process. Um, way smoother, a lot, lot less risky, um, um, easier to build a community on top of it. Um, the only downside, of course, is you, have, you lose the opportunity to have like this big uh, release bang. But I think this is really something that we have to balance and maybe stop considering open source projects as products that you want to market as much unless it is really at the core of your business. All right. So last but not least, patching. Why is patching super important? Because it's the most common activity and the most important one in software development, right? When, it, when it's tied to open source. Um, and you want to make that be as frictionless as possible. Um, uh, today, uh, really open source is um, uh, part of this broad network um, of software that you rely on and contribute back to. And so, you really want to make it super easy for your organization's uh, your organization to be participating in that ecosystem um, in a smooth way, right? How do you do that? Well, you make upfront decisions about what your engineers can do and cannot do. You can use uh, approval and, and, and deny lists for that. Um, and um, you 
really let legal focus on the difficult cases. And as you make those more difficult decisions, you document those and you build them into your proven denialists. And so it makes it uh, increasingly uh, fast for your organization to be able to make decisions about this and uh, avoids wasting everyone's time. Okay, so we've looked at uh, um, what, what makes a really good open source contributing uh, policy. It deals with using open source. It deals with contributing open source outside and inside of work, and then about specifically releasing and patching software. But we can actually do more than that, and we can turn those policies into services or applications, right? Th those lists that you were um, thinking about before, well, you can really essentially automate a lot of the stuff around pre-established requirements. For example, it's okay to patch anything that's MIT licensed on GitHub. Maybe that's okay for your organization. And you can also automatically reject things that you really don't want to do. Um, and uh, again, manually handle the rest, right? And so by doing this, um, Adobe was actually able to shorten the review time for everything from roughly a week to roughly half a day. And this is all for the things that needed to be reviewed. All of the rest that had been automated, um, that had been pre-cached, was suddenly instantaneous for in their software engineers. And this has a lot of benefits because as you build so a software like this, you can start to collect data about your open source practices. You can start knowing, well, what um, open source projects are we actually contributing to a lot? Would it make sense to hire maybe from this project? Um, you can start promoting what you do. Um, you can start connecting if you're a large organizations, um, organizations um, within your org, uh, departments that are relying on the same piece of software but didn't know that they were doing that. Uh, you can really, create a lot of very valuable things on top of this. And um, folks, that's all I have uh, for um, you today. Uh, uh, thank you very much for attending uh, this talk. If you want to continue this conversation, uh, my email is right here. It's toby at unlockopen.com. Um, if you want help implementing policies like this within the organization, this is part of what I do as an open source consultant. Um, uh, if you want to help automating it, uh, this is also something I can help you uh, with. Uh, feel free to reach out um, either way. Um, uh, thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye. Um,